Hi, I'm Heidi Rader with the University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service, and I'm here in Petersburg, Alaska at the 2023 Southeast Alaska Farmer Summit. And I'm here with Jen Landry. Uh, she's from Gustavus and has a farm as well as a variety of other businesses. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about her business and, and what she does. So Jen, can you tell us um, kind of how you started a farm and, and why you started Stellar Botanicals? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've uh, started out, I would say at Sterling College uh, and accidentally got into agriculture and Sterling was like the school that it's uh, known for students being involved and feeding students the most food produced from the farm. And so I didn't go for agriculture, but I got sucked into agriculture and have never left it. So I worked on farms um, for many years across the country and then went to Fairbanks and worked on farms there and um, lived at the bottom of Goldstream Creek. And it wasn't the ideal um, farm situation, but we were growing our own food for a whole year, growing all our vegetables and gathering berries. And um, Fairbanks wasn't exactly my place for the long term. So we moved to Gustavus and thought, well, how much work could growing food for other people be since we were already doing a ton of inefficient work? And it turns out it could be a ton more work. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we love local food and yeah, and berries and having a diversity in our diet and then being able to encourage other people to grow more Alaskan food and living in a rural community where food is transported with multiple steps of freight and sitting in warehouses and barges and very compromised often by the time it gets to us it feels like really an important thing to be to be doing and helping others to do so part of my business is stellar botanicals is that i also sell garden supplies and have inadvertently become like the garden advisor in town um, when people come up to pick supplies and they pick my brain and the breadth of your business is amazing. You know, everything from drying and sell growing, drying, selling herbs to consulting. Um, and it sounds like you have quite a diversity of crops as well. Mm -hmm. So in part, we want to be eating a diversity of crops. Um, we don't want to just eat salads. We want to have, um, in particular, a lot of root crops and things that store well. That's one of our emphasis. Um, so having lots of cabbage and beets and um, daikons and sauerkraut, things that we can um, enjoy throughout the winter and not get tired of, um, parsnips being another big one. And so, yeah, for us living in a small town, um, we've got a small amount of people, a customer base that we can serve. And so we can't just grow cabbage, say, or garlic. Um, we really need to be diverse so that we um, have customers coming back and have enough to provide them and, and don't have waste with things that we can't sell. And that in itself is a, is a big challenge because I know I've talked to other farmers and they've really honed in on some crops that they grow really well and, that, and then it gets easier. You're just growing a few crops, but maintaining mm -hmm. that level of diversity is really impressive too. And you said that you also stay away from any kind of mechanization. At this point we have, and that might be changing um, now that we've put a lot of work into hands, um, doing everything by hand. We're actually contemplating maybe moving up into a BCS tractor because we are getting older um, and we actually have just uh, purchased the land that was leased to us, mm -hmm. um, that was graciously allowed us to get started. And so all of a sudden um, our parameters are changing and the question is whether we want to expand, whether we want to take on mechanization, mm -hmm. even on a small, small scale, like a small, BCS tractor is mm. what we're thinking about, but um, it's a big, big leap for us. And we've been very hard headed, not wanting to use mechanization and really paying the price with inefficiency and physical labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of minimizing plastics as well, or do you use a little bit of uh, like oh. season extension techniques? Or? Very much so. I mean, we, we would like not to use any, that would be the goal. And I think more than other farms we really use less, um, and that's actually a presentation I'm gonna give soon, but uh, so like our greenhouse, we don't have any high tunnels and we pay, pay a price for that. It's a little harder for us, but our greenhouse is scavenged um, large like picture windows, four foot by four foot windows that we advertised for free windows, made sure they didn't have a coating on them like a e-film. Mm -hmm. yep. 
and then separated them out into single pane windows and that's our greenhouse and so it's not movable <laughs> it's fixed mm -hmm. um, but it's gorgeous and uh, allows us to do some some indoor growing um, and we definitely use way more row cover we can't get away from plastic unfortunately mm -hmm. in alaska um, but we do try to minimize and if we are going to use plastic like i use a bioplastic and it doesn't um it's supposed to break down in six months in other places and i find that it will last for three years so mm -hmm. i'm able if i'm careful with it i can pull it off like my garlic in the spring and go put it somewhere else and use it to suppress grass or use it to make a bed or as much as i can think to to repurpose something I'm going to do it and like most of the plastic we have is from construction company sites or um, we're not just going out and mm -hmm. that's not really allowed in our house and what does your season go till or when does it start usually my season starts march 1st i start planting onions and herbs um actually technically some years i start in january because a lot of herb seeds need cold stratification so i'll start them in little flats and then put them outside mm -hmm. in the freeze thaw. Um, but those don't take very much maintenance once I've put the seeds out. Um, it's just remembering they're there and that they're, they're getting moisture. Um, the real season starts March 1st and then after March 1st it just keeps building and building. Um, and then I sale starts mid-May and that's when the real season starts piling up and I start selling greens, salad greens then um, every week. and. My season's very variable and it depends how smart I am. <laughs> so some years this year I was actually selling kale, fresh kale out of the garden through December and then kale from the greenhouse. I was still selling into the first week of January. Wow. And um, let's just say that's not a very efficient way. <laughs> My hands are freezing. <laughs> the kale's like half frozen. <laughs> it's more, much more and even um, greater labor of love. Um, but because in Gustavus, just my setup, I own a storefront now and I sell my produce out of that and having a winter market where people are able to come in and buy produce throughout the winter. So I'm selling onions, garlic, kale through those months. I'm still selling garlic now. I just finished selling the onions. So this is February. So that gives me a much more extended. And if we had a better root cellar system, I would contemplate maybe I would just do root crops and forget some of the summer crops. We'll see. Maybe that's a future decision. I, I'm sure people really appreciate the the greens in the winter. Mm, yeah, and that's that's what motivates me to keep going. But mm -hmm. I am learning over time. Like sometimes I do just need to make a boundary. Like this year, I said yeah. <laughs> I am not doing greens into October, <laughs> no matter what it means. <laughs> and uh, and that's where the poultry comes in. Is I have a real. Um, reluctance to waste anything and if at least it's going somewhere else um, even though people tell me all the time the compost isn't the waste it's still repurposing it mm -hmm. um, I'm reluctant if I can find some other way to utilize it for humans first mm -hmm. that's ideal do you like for somebody growing in southeast do you have any recommendations of like the any really easy crop to grow or mm. a great variety mm -hmm. Good question. I guess it depends. I would assume we're talking vegetables. Um, I mean, kale is probably one of the easiest um, and it, it really is not bothered by the moisture, the amount of rain, very few. Um, we, ha we have serious root maggots here. I, I came from the interior and we thought our first year we could get away without row covers. Like it's our first year in the middle of this meadow. There's <laughs> no way they'll find us. And they were fierce. <laughs> so yeah, that was a mistake. But uh, most people can get away. We do cover our kale since we need it for our market. Um, but once it's established, the root maggots aren't going to bother it. And um, I would say that's the easiest. And, and a special feature of Southeast is that I can pull my crops in the fall like kale is often one. I'm, I plant a winter crop so that I can sell it later. Around solstice, I plant it and then it's mature in the fall. And if I'm still thinning it in August or September and I leave it in the beds or in the rows, it will keep growing even though the weed is not, the weed is, the plant is the not root. in the soil. It's just so moist. Wow. That, um, that's, a, that's how easy it is to grow kale in Southeast. Yeah, we talked to some gardeners who said it could grow seven, eight feet high. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's impressive. Um, 
So what about a favorite tool do you have for that? Uh, <laughs> I'm probably the wrong person to answer that question. <laughs> <Your hands. laughs> um, there are a yeah. lot of tools I've returned because <laughs> they can't keep up with my broad fork, my speeding fork, and my rake, which so are those, like those my, are your core, favorites. <laughs> my core tools. Um, yeah, probably those are um, some favorites. There's definitely the wheel hoe is up there. Um, pretty useful trying to keep back a meadow. Um, and I don't know, there's, there's definitely a lot of useful tools for different things, like the ammonia we were just talking about for spraying slugs. Mm -hmm. uh, we love our little spray <laughs> containers. Yeah. So yeah, but, but t we tend to be simpler. Mm -hmm. Are you using any kind of uh, weed barrier type fabric in the rows? Or? Yeah, we are not. We're talking about it because we are really challenged. Uh, we live in a meadow and the meadow grass um, in spite of all our efforts, keeps keeps coming. It's mm -hmm. uh, very persistent, and so we do have some rows that are. Um, yeah, last year we actually had a local nonprofit um, educational group came out, and so seven people came, and we just turned the rows all together. And so we'll see this year how much that knocked it back. But we're talking about trialing some mulch, uh, some of that. What, is, what would that be? Uh, like weed shield or something, some mm -hmm. fabric. Yeah. Um, but I give a big sigh because it just feels wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, do you have one crop that's, that's kind of your main crop that you sell? Yeah, so I would say salad greens, like a lot of small farms. Um, and especially we're a small town with uh, influx of seasonal people to our park and um, park employees that come in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that seasonal people, they don't have a garden um, and lodges want. And so that's probably our most lucrative technically crop, but mm -hmm. it's also the most work. Um, you got to cut it, you got to spin it, you got to replant it every week. So. Um, yeah, it's a great crop and I really, I make my own. I'm very proud, like I haven't found a salad mix I actually like or that my customers mm. like. There's always someone who doesn't like arugula, doesn't like something. And so I mix my own seeds every week and make my own blends, which is oh, fun. Cool. And um, like as a herbalist, I get to put all kinds of little like shungiku in there and oh. fun things that people have no idea. They're always coming up every year and being like, what is this? <laughs> Do you sell your, your lettuce mix? <laughs> as uh, as the seed, mix. the seed, yeah. I don't because it's just like I bring my bucket of se green seeds out with me every week and just mm -hmm. whatever I feel like. Um, oh, cool. That's what I do. And are you hand seeding broadcasting or do you mm -hmm. use this? Okay. I am. Um, yeah, that's one of the things I've tried different seeders and I haven't found a one that has worked for me. And mostly because of the organics and we've got clumps of seaweed here or there and. Mm. Um, that's one thing where if we do move into more mechanization and a little BCS tiller, and you'll have a then we'll have seed a bed. flat surface and maybe we could find a cedar that we liked. Mm -hmm. How do you irrigate or water? <laughs> so we've spent years hand watering um, and as we've expanded, uh, there were two years there was a drought in Southeast mm. and that was where um, we hit the wall and we were actually having to go to the creek, fill up barrels in a wow. truck. <laughs> empty the barrels <laughs> into our barrels back home, hand water. Wow. And that, that was the point of maximal inefficiency. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, people make fun of us because when we came from Fairbanks, we actually unhooked the well in G to our house in oh. Gustavus. We were like, we've never had running water. We don't need this. Oh, geez. <laughs> and so funny. we got this crazy reputation as those people <laughs> that unhooked their well. Um, but in 2018, we did hook it up primarily for the garden and but not for indoor plumbing. <laughs> um, I did after years of uh, uh, back and forth with my husband, I do have a washing machine. And the primary reason we gave it, he gave in was because of my uh, bodywork therapy practice where I am not doing massage, but uh, Eastern styles of bodywork. And so I need to wash my sheets yeah. <laughs> and buckets of bedding. <laughs> it yeah. was also an added burden when we're doing so much. Right. And this, this past June, we had a very dry June and just even using watering by hand with hoses, we were each spending at least two hours a day Wow. watering so we were glad we had at least transitioned that far and right we'll see. and if we expand more we'll probably have to think of something else and you also have ducks and chickens and you you showed some photos of very wet soil in your garden <laughs> but they they yes. love the 
the moisture and they eat the slugs some and Indeed. and you incorporate the manure into your garden as well. So this will be more of a first, but yes, part of Gustavus has a serious invasive black slug problem and this family raised the ducks and ex raised them eating the black slugs. Mm. So they got used to it and they're a larger bl blue Swedish duck. And uh, so they actually ended up moving. I inherited their ducks. They got gifted to me and I was very excited because we have, um, we don't have the worst slug problem, but we have a persistent slug problem. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> just something that can take a lot of time added into your schedule is having to go look for slugs. And, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. um, so that can be very time consuming. And um, so my, my goal, what I'm working on is a duck moat around the garden as my little barrier um, so that that'll reduce slugs entering in hopefully oh. and or maybe it'll just going to trap the slugs in I'm not sure oh, yet right <laughs> um, but right now our, our garden itself the vegetable part is fenced with a uh, moose proof you know five six foot fence and the ducks can kind of free range out under the berries and things that aren't vegetables um, and they don't they love the slugs so much and we must have enough slugs that they really don't eat any of our vegetation mm. so far that's in the gardens protected but any of the other stuff um, and they're just a joy like it can get really dreary in southeast mm. having to go out in the muck and the mud and the rain and the wind and go harvest or plant and for me it's like therapy to go watch the ducks just having a ball <laughs> no matter how rainy it is and how much water is on the ground that this is delightful and that helps cheer me up too. Oh, that's great. So, and I would say that ducks have much um, more interesting personalities than chickens. Mm, so they, they are, are very fun. cute. Yeah. Um, fun. Yeah. And the chickens we got um, primarily because we are doing a lot of compost. Like I go, when I go in to sell vegetables on a Saturday, um, I come home with people's donations of compost mm. and Gustavus has great composting, but you have to pay for it by the mm. pound. So there are some people who aren't going to do that. And if I offer that as an option, they'll give it to me. And we've been spending a lot of time then um, turning compost. And so our goal is to see if we can uh, utilize the chickens to be turning our compost oh, for us. Nice. And, uh, What's the size of your flock? Uh, so right now I'm at, I'm a little over what, uh, I'm my allotment from my husband. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely my birds, not his interest. Uh, so I have six ducks and I have 10 chickens. Oh, okay. So pretty small, but I distributed a fair amount to get down to that number oh, around, yeah. <laughs> around yeah. Gustavus. Great. Um, um, do you have any advice for someone who would like to start a farm in Southeast Alaska? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest barrier I hear of in Southeast is land is very expensive here. And um, like we ended up in a deal with someone that let us, gave us a very generous lease of their land um, and we didn't actually own it to grow our garden. And um, yeah, I think land is the biggest challenge and finding creative ways to get or use land that you're gonna to wanna to farm on. Um, and we spent a lot of time visiting communities and with a shovel and like we went all over Gist Davis for three weeks. And mm -hmm. some areas we were just like, no way, <laughs> that is not where we're gonna start a garden. Um, I, my stipulation was I wanted the best gardening spot since we had the worst gardening spot in Fairbanks. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, really choosing your location wisely and maybe just talking to people and what opportunities are out there where you can get started yeah, that's great advice. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think that's about all my questions. Hmm. I guess I could add, I mean, so another part of my, my business is uh, my herb farm portion. And um, I love growing herbs and I'm happy to ever um, communicate with people about that. Um, what I have found is that it's a harder, like produce is much more profitable than growing herbs. Mm. And so it really has to be a passion. Like people line up for raspberries. No one's going to line up for echinacea at this point in time. <laughs> um, even during a pandemic, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. I thought that would be like my moment. <laughs> and, uh, um, so um, it's something you do for other reasons. And um, it's, it's beautiful and there's lots of gifts in it. But um, yeah, just having a plan when you start something, do you have a market for it? Is there an end user? Are you selling any of your herbs online? I sell raw herbs online. 
and I'm kind of mixed and go back and forth about selling them. So right now I do sell some through Salt and Soil. We were selling to some, a couple tea companies um, and they've both changed operations and one moved. So now we have lots of mint, more than we can ever use in a year. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, and I wholesale a little bit, but that's really, it's um, not very economical because it takes too much time mm -hmm. to process the herbs. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this great information and telling us about your farm. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs>